sectors because everyone benefits with accessibility. And we are doing this, this, improving. We are in the process. But yeah, and when you are already, you can even add the logo of the W3C uh, level of accessibility. They have uh, the three logos of the three levels. So it's really important also that you, um, you know, share this information with the world. And I, I think it will be like, Developers and designers will feel really good about it because it's really something, uh, really something uh, important to do. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, but also from a from a legal perspective, um, especially if you are in uh, North America, um, a lot of the legal demands have also been where. There have been lawsuits uh, in millions and millions by very, very prestigious companies. Like if you all have heard of Target, um, all the universities have all the universities. I'm sure all of you use Netflix. All of them have been fined for for not providing the basic aspects of subtitles, or they've been fined for not for users for not being able to do essential functions like using e-commerce websites or even, you know, buying a plane ticket. So there's also legal mandates, especially if you all have contributors from the US or otherwise. Uh, but yes, um, we don't have much time, but I also wanted to say thank you. But before I say thank you, we also wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what we provide and how we can help. Um, so we have a pro bono mandate with one of our funders uh, called Open Technology Fund. Uh, they fund a lot of open source technology uh, to advance uh, privacy and security, especially of those who have been historically marginalized. And if your tool fa falls within their remit, where it works on open source, it works on preserving privacy and security, um, and works on uh, curtailing censorship and surveillance, we can provide our services, uh, you know, whether it's coaching or training or audits, or even implementation pro bono. And but then we also work a lot outside open source. Um, and yeah, we, uh, we look forward to collaborating more. Uh, these are our details. I'm happy to have a chat. We are, some of us are also going to be at the social event in the evening and tomorrow. Uh, so you can find us there. But thank you so much for listening. I also have some Indian sweets. Uh, so if anyone wants a few, thank you so much. We're so happy to see such a lovely room. Thank you so much for listening to us. Um, and hope you have a great day and hope you learned a lot about web accessibility. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy and Rashi, for the wonderful talk in which, you know, open source can also be used for the accessibility. I think this is the one of the different talk in the total summit, I believe so. And uh, also thanks for the Indian sweets, which you mentioned. And if you have any questions, uh, you can ask now. The platform is free for the questions. Yeah. So uh, uh, do you have any uh, uh, published? published about the uh, general rule about the guidelines for improving accessibility on websites. the name campaigns we have two campa campaigns one it's accessibility campaign and the other it's usability campaign and if you click on there you will find resources even results about our testing with big blue button uh, jitsi meet and other tools that we tested and information about general concepts of accessibility and inclusion I've just gone ahead with the slides of the organizations we work with so we work with briar we work with a lot of open source tools, horizontal, circular, the teams here. Uh, just a few to give you an example. I'll go back to the other slide, localization lab. Um, and a lot of people also like doing audits beforehand because they like translating this service into seven or eight languages. So there's a lot of localization element also in it. And if you want to do accessibility work in a different language, we will also need people who understand that language and uh, complement it with that also being an accessibility expert. So there are two things that go hand in hand. For example, if it's in Vietnamese or it's in Hindi or in Espanol, uh, we need localization and accessibility experts to go hand in hand. Any more questions? Um, you mentioned accessibility for PDF files. Um, that is really hard topic, I guess. Um, I mean, just just when was it? A few months ago, the new standard came out from Adobe about accessibility. Um, how do you deal with 
companies that ask you and provide PDFs? I mean, how do you deal with making them accessible, those PDFs? Hopkins University, is that the correct pronunciation? Stop, uh -huh. Hopkins University. And they, for, at first they sent us all the PDFs and we did remediation with this PDF. Uh, there, there is an automatic uh, validator on Adobe. And after that, you need to do manually all the tagging on the elements of the PDF. Uh, and it takes a lot of time because also you cannot like it, there is no control C. So if you made a mistake, you need to redo everything. And then uh, what we proposed it uh, was like a training, uh, accessibility tra training for PDF with the, uh, they are in Africa with the team that creates the designs because it's actually really easy to make uh, the original file accessible. And then when you convert it to PDF, it's uh, like uh, you may no need to do anything. So you can drag this accessibility from the original. If you don't consider accessibility from the beginning, then you need to fix a lot of things. And also Adobe has limitations. So even if you have like if you have like a really complex content in, in your PDF, like a diagram or something, you cannot do it accessible. Like you uh, better offer an alternative text or something. But so yeah, like the thing is like we need to. Uh, think before, like think about accessibility before we create something and not after. Because you make uh, graphics, uh, designs, um, data, uh, graphs, uh, converting, uh, because it contains a lot of information that is very important often from the accessibility point. You want to see the data. Are you uh, having there any insights or what are you doing in this direction? The thing about data and the, you know, the basic recommendations regarding accessibility and data, it will be like if you have a complex table, we recommend you that you divide that information into just two simple tables or try to create just tables that have one heading uh, of uh, in the one first heading in the column or one first heading in the row. So uh, you present as simple as information as possible. And this way you can make the table accessible in a PDF because if not, it will be crazy. And also with graphs, uh, maybe the graphic, if it's too complicated data, the graphic can be accessible, but you will always have the table. So if it's an HTML table accessible with one heading and one row, uh, it will be really easy. So we recommend to have both the table and the graph. So you can have like uh, ones who benefit from the graph and ones who benefit from the table. Ma'am, I have a question. How do you manage with the graphs, diagrams then? Table is fine. How do you do with graphs? Okay. Figure even, even yeah. pictures and yeah. other. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Any more queries do you have? Yes. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Yes. Oh, it's time for sweets. Oh, we still have more time. Yes. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi. Say hi. <laughs> yes. Yeah, now we have another session, how REST error handling is web development. This is from Kwan, hope I spelled right. The chief technology officer of AgriConnect. He's a full stock developer focusing in IoT, which is my area actually. And he's also a false developer. I wish all of you enjoy this session. Yeah, you're welcome, Kwan. Hello, xin chào mọi người. So, I think most of people here are Vietnamese, right? So, I will speak into language. <laughs> okay. So, uh, bởi vì mọi, đa số mọi người ở đây là người, người Việt cho nên mình sẽ trình bày bằng hai thứ tiếng luôn. Uh, who is a computer student? Uh, ai, ai, ai là sinh viên về ngành uh, khoa học máy tính không? Ở đây có ai là sinh viên khoa học máy tính không? 
không có ai giơ tay hết hả? No one raise hand. Okay, so have you been ever heard about Rust programming language? Ah, you, you, okay. Ah, you, I think you will speak about the Rust. Okay. <cười> Uh, anh này tí nữa anh này cũng sẽ nói về ngôn ngữ lập trình Rust. Uh, here, this is the mascot of uh, the Rust programming language. Uh, đây đây là linh vật của ngôn ngữ lập trình Rust uh, trong thế giới phần mềm nguồn mở. Các bạn sẽ thấy là rất nhiều phần mềm nguồn mở dùng linh vật là động vật. Many operate, uh, many open source software use some animal as uh, mascot. À, hôm nay là mình sẽ nói về cái trải nghiệm cá nhân của mình khi mà mình làm về web và mình thấy rằng cái ngôn ngữ này nó nó, nó, nó giúp cho mình rất dễ dàng thuận tiện trong cái việc phát triển ứng dụng web. À, today I will uh, tell about my experience when I use Rust programming language to write uh, web app and uh, how it helped. Uh, my experience uh, better. Uh, a bit an introduction about me. I am the open source developer and uh, I work on many fields from the web development and uh, system and uh, embedded programming. And uh, I also use Rust for web and also embedded. Uh, giới thiệu trước về mình là mình là lập trình viên chuyên làm việc về phần mềm nguồn mở. Thì mình đã làm việc trên mọi các lĩnh vực từ web cho tới phần mềm nhúng. Mình cũng dùng ngôn ngữ Rust trong cả web và phần mềm nhúng luôn. Và hiện tại thì mình có một startup mini về IoT trong nông nghiệp ở thành phố Hồ Chí Minh. So I have a small startup about agriculture in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, đây là nội dung bài nói chuyện hôm nay. Uh, let me uh, introduce a bit about Rust programming. Uh, what is its selling point? Uh, from before when we uh, start with other programming language, we see about how we uh, catch the error in those uh, languages. Like in Python, we use uh, which one is called exception handling. So in Python, when you run this code, you have to add, because this code can uh, have some error, we need to catch it so that we can decide what to do in the case. Uh, but uh, one downside of uh, Python exception handling is that when we look into the signature of the function, we don't know which error can happen. Như mình muốn so sánh về Rust một chút xíu với các ngôn ngữ khác, chẳng hạn như trước giờ là khi mình làm việc với các ngôn ngữ khác thì mỗi ngôn ngữ có một cái cách uh, bắt lỗi khác nhau, nhưng mà đều có một số yếu điểm nào đó, chẳng hạn như đây là một dòng cốt của ngôn ngữ Python. Khi mình chạy một cái dòng cốt này, thì thông thường là các cái dòng cốt này nó sẽ sẽ xảy ra lỗi, thì mình sẽ thường là phải thêm cái dòng này để bắt lỗi. Mà nhưng mà một cái hạn chế của những cái ngôn ngữ mà dùng exception handling giống như Python ở đây là ví dụ như mình nhìn vào cái nhìn vào cái cái cái, cái, cái khai báo của cái hàm này là mình sẽ không biết là cái hàm này có thể bắn ra cái lỗi gì để mà mình biết được cái dòng này. Thông thường là mình sẽ phải thử đi thử lại. Thứ nhất là thường là mình đọc tài liệu. Mình sẽ phải đọc kỹ các tài liệu coi người viết tài liệu họ nói là cái hàm này có thể bắn ra lỗi gì. Nhưng mà đôi khi tài liệu không đầy đủ thì mình sẽ phải test đi test lại. Nhưng mà với... <cười> Còn uh, this is the exception, uh, the, the error hand handling of C uh, language and it's e even worse. For example, uh, in C, they use a uh, variable, the same variable. 
for every function that can uh, throw error. And uh, you can also not sure when you look into the function, you also don't know which error can happen. And uh, thêm một so sánh nữa, đây là ngôn ngữ C. Đối với ngôn ngữ C thì cách uh, bắt lỗi của nó nó còn uh, tệ hơn nữa. Ví dụ như mình phải dùng một cái biến để bắt cái lỗi và cái biến này mình sẽ thấy cái dòng cốt này là không có cái chỗ nào để cho thấy nó có tác động vào cái biến bắt lỗi này hết. Sau khi mình gọi cái hàm này xong á, là mình phải kiểm tra cái biến này và bị, thậm chí là một cái biến này bị chia sẻ bởi nhiều hàm. Ví dụ như mình gọi nhiều hàm C, á, mỗi hàm C đấy nó đều thay đổi cái biến này và mình không biết là cái lỗi này là từ hàm nào sinh ra. Cho nên khi mà viết C mình lại phải rất mất nhiều công sức để cẩn thận ở cái vụ này. À, còn đây là uh, cách bắt lỗi của Rust. This is how Rust uh, handle error. Uh, you can look into this. This is a function that is declared in Rust. You can see that it specifies which error that can happen. Đối, đối với ngôn ngữ Rust là khi bạn khai báo một cái hàm á, là bạn sẽ phải khai báo luôn là cái lỗi gì trong hàm này có thể bắn ra. Và đây là một cái khi mà gọi một cái hàm mà có thể bắn ra lỗi thì đây là cái cách để mình nhận biết là cái hàm này là thành công hay là thất bại. Uh, this is how we handle uh, error that can happen from a function code. Uh, this one is we use uh, much. This is one uh, nice syntax of uh, Rust to 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 check the return error of the function. It can be uh, successful. It can be error, but it can be many error. And you, you can catch one specific error. With this specific error, uh, what do you want to do? And with this specific error, what do you want to do? Uh, đối với, đối với Rust, thì Rust có một cái cấu trúc đặc biệt tên là match. Trong đó bạn có thể kiểm tra những cái trường hợp mà cái một cái biến trả về nó rơi vào trường hợp nào để có cái cách xử lý phù hợp. Chẳng hạn như đây là trường hợp nó trả về thành công. Còn đây là hai trường hợp nó trả về lỗi nhưng mà nó lại có hai loại lỗi khác nhau. Thì bạn có thể bắt riêng lại trường hợp nếu như bạn có muốn cách muốn có một cái cách hành xử riêng cho mỗi một loại lỗi. Còn nếu như bạn có thể muốn lờ đi nghĩa là bất kỳ lỗi nào tôi cũng làm như vậy thì bạn có thể bỏ bớt cái nhánh này đi và lúc này chỉ bắt chung chung với cú pháp tương tự như vậy thôi. So we uh, look into what uh, special about uh, Rust result type. Bây giờ là mình sẽ nhìn vào cái kiểu dữ liệu đặc biệt mà cái ngôn ngữ Rust này nó có so với cái những ngôn ngữ truyền thống khác. Như mình mọi người để ý là vừa nãy là mình khai báo cái hàm này nó trả về kiểu là result. Đây là cái cái giá trị cái kiểu dữ liệu khi mà nó thành công này khi mà thành công thì cái chính chính là cái chữ t này là cái biến t này là nó sẽ thuộc cái kiểu này còn khi mà lỗi thì nó sẽ cả trở về vậy à, here when we uh, when when we uh, uh, undertake the return type of a function it Be, uh, it contains two elements. One is the type of value when function success, and one is in case of error. For example, this is the function to pass a string to integer. It can be success, for example, if uh, this string can be passed to integer, then it's return OK true. It means that. This is the success case, and 
with this uh, string yet it cannot be passed to any integer so it return error and đây là một cái ví dụ mà để hình dung về cái kiểu dữ liệu result như chẳng hạn như khi mà mình muốn À, chuyển đổi từ một cái chuỗi về một cái số nguyên thì trong trường hợp này là cái chuỗi là hai thì mình biết là cái hai này là nó sẽ chuyển đổi về số nguyên được thì cái hàm này nó sẽ trả về ok ok chính là một cái nhánh của cái result này này còn truyền vào cái chuỗi z chuỗi z thì không có tương ứng với số nguyên nào thì nó sẽ trả về error lỗi và trong đó bên trong cái error này là sẽ có một cái giá trị cái giá trị này sẽ là tương ứng với cái kiểu mà mình khai báo ở đây cụ thể đối với cái cái hàm from string này thì nó là cái biến e này là thuộc kiểu passed in error <cười> sorry I need to print In 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 Rust, you can use any type for the error site, but normally, uh, in number of application, they people use the type that uh, implement this chair, so that they can change the error uh, throw out from many nested code. Trong uh, Rust, thì thank you. Mọi người thì trong rút thì mình có thể dùng bất cứ kỳ cái kiểu dữ liệu nào cho cái nhánh lỗi này hết. Nhưng mà thông thường trong các ứng dụng thì người ta sẽ dùng những cái kiểu dữ liệu nào mà có mà nó implement cái chair này để mà sau đó nó sẽ nối khi mà một hàm gọi tới các hàm con xong rồi các hàm con lại gọi tới hàm cháu rồi gọi tới hàm chắt thì cứ mỗi lần gọi sâu xuống những cái lỗi nó cứ bung ra bung ra thì người ta dùng cái, cái che cái kiểu dữ liệu này để mà gom những cái lỗi phát sinh từ nhiều tầng lại à, và cái che này là một cái khái niệm mà đặc biệt mà chỉ xuất hiện trong uh, Rust và một vài ngôn ngữ học thuật khác tức là khi mà bạn học về các ngôn ngữ lập trình truyền thống như Python, Java, C bạn sẽ không thấy khái niệm che này và uh, this is one uh, thing about Rust is that Rust doesn't allow you to skip to skip the error. So when you call some function that can fall, you must have to handle the error case so that you can can cannot uh, make a mistake or you cannot uh, produce a bug. Đối với một điểm đặc biệt của ngôn ngữ Rust đấy là khi bạn gặp một cái gọi một cái hàm nào mà có khả năng phát sinh ra lỗi thì Rust sẽ bắt bạn buộc phải xử trí cái trường hợp lỗi đó. Tức là trong nhiều ngôn ngữ khi mà bạn gọi một cái hàm á, mặc dù hàm đấy có thể ra lỗi nhưng mà bạn cứ tưởng tượng là không yên tâm đi tôi sẽ gặp may mắn cái hàm này khi chạy rồi nó sẽ không ra lỗi đâu. Xong rồi sẽ bạn bỏ qua cái cái bước uh, bắt lỗi đó. Thì đối với Rust thì không thể như vậy chẳng hạn như chẳng hạn như tôi gọi một cái hàm risk string này, này cái hàm này là nó có khả năng sinh ra lỗi bởi vì trong quá trình bạn đọc có có thể bị cái cái dữ liệu từ đĩa đĩa cứng nó bị hư gì đó sẽ không đọc được thì sẽ, đó là một trường hợp lỗi thì rus bắt bạn là phải bắt được cái trường hợp lỗi đấy không được bỏ qua và nó sẽ báo nó sẽ báo cái cảnh báo ở đây nếu như bạn muốn bỏ qua việc bắt lỗi Rust will warn you when you try to skip handling error. Uh, this is the comparison uh, between the Rust style and uh, other traditional style, but I will skip this. 
uh, có thể là we 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 may think that when root always uh, force you to handle the error you may think that it will make your code long then and for example this is when you call many functions and each of them can uh, return error then you have to catch the error of this function and catch the error of this function and then catch the error of this function you think that you have to do many things your code may be long um, bạn khi mà dùng root thì với cái luật của root là bạn phải bắt bất kỳ trường hợp lỗi nào có thể xảy ra bạn sẽ nghĩ rằng là nếu làm vậy thì code của tôi sẽ dài dòng quá chẳng hạn như một cái ví dụ này là bạn chỉ gọi ba cái hàm con một hai ba gọi hàm con thứ nhất bạn phải kiểm tra nó có lỗi hay không gọi hàm thứ hai cho lại bạn kiểm tra kết quả đấy có lỗi hay thành công rồi hàm thứ ba nhưng mà ban đầu là mình nghĩ vậy thôi nhưng mà thực ra Rust nó còn có một cái tính năng khác đấy là cái cái tán tử này để giúp bạn viết code ngắn gọn hơn. So Rust has question mark operator that make you your, your code shorter than you think. For example, here here is the original code and here's The code with uh, question mark it reduces a lot. Đây là ví dụ sử dụng cái toán tử chấm hỏi để mình uh, viết cái phần mà xử lý lỗi ngắn hơn. Chẳng hạn đây là cái cốt ban đầu khi chưa dùng cái toán tử đó và đây là cốt khi dùng toán tử đó. <cười> Bạn giờ cái ý nghĩa của toán tử là này là Chẳng hạn khi mà bạn gọi cái chiêu một này nó sinh ra lỗi Bạn đẩy cái lỗi để lên hàm tra Bạn sẽ thấy là cái hàm tra này có 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 ký hiệu là lỗi trả về là app error này, app error này. Bạn gọi tới đây bạn dấu chấm hỏi cái là nếu mà có lỗi Nó trả về đây Xong còn nếu thành công thì nó chạy tiếp xuống dòng dưới Chạy tiếp xuống như xuống dòng dưới nếu mà bị lỗi Nó dừng lại xong nó trả lỗi lên đây Xong rồi nếu nó thành công thì nó lại chạy xuống phía dưới Uh, ngoài những cái hàm mà mình để ý là những cái hàm mà ví dụ vừa rồi là trả về result result là uh, biểu hiện là thành công hoặc thất bại thì cái toán tử chấm hỏi này nó cũng ứng dụng được với những cái hàm mà trả về kiểu dữ liệu option so the question mark operator uh, not only it can be used in the function that return result but also can be used with the function that return option thì mình nói thêm một chút là cái kiểu option này cũng là một cái kiểu dữ liệu đặc biệt của Rust là hay là là biểu thị cái việc có dữ liệu và bị không có dữ liệu thiếu vắng dữ liệu cái này nó tương tự như bên các ngôn ngữ khác thì họ dùng null nhưng mà uh, null đó thì khi mà dùng luôn á cũng có nhiều người là họ khi mà họ viết code đó, họ vội vã quá họ cứ nghĩ là uh, cái biến này uh, trả về từ hàm này thì tôi nghĩ là tôi sẽ may mắn nó sẽ không có trả về luôn đâu xong rồi họ sẽ bỏ qua cái bước kiểm tra luôn đấy họ sẽ gọi tiếp rồi sau đó dẫn đến là lỗi hoặc là class phần mềm nhưng mà bên rust thì cái 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 option cái kiểu option này nó khác với cái kiểu luôn đấy là nó giống như result là nó sẽ bọc cái giá trị thực bên trong này Chẳng hạn như result là trong trường hợp mà thành công đó, Nó trả về ok thì nó cũng bọc cái giá trị thực ở bên trong ok Khi nó trả về error nó bọc cái giá trị thực bên trong error Cái option này cũng vậy khi mà cái hàm này nó trả về và có dữ liệu đó, Thì nó bọc dữ liệu bên trong option Còn khi mà nó trả cái hàm đấy nó không có dữ liệu trả về Thì cái cái mà mình nhận được là một cái nâng lúc đấy là mình sẽ buộc phải xử lý, mình sẽ phải bóc cái ra giống như là với lý do vậy. Thì cái tán tử này nó cũng giúp ví dụ như gọi hàm chiêu một này nó trả về một cái option. 
mình dùng dấu hỏi cái là nó trả về đây nó dừng ở đây luôn trong trường hợp mà trả về nên đó, thì nó dừng tại đây và nó trả nên về cho cái hàm cha rồi gọi tới hàm thứ hai nếu mà gặp nên đó, thì nó dừng luôn nó trả nên về cho hàm cha còn nếu như trả về một cái giá trị gì đó thì nó cứ đi tiếp <cười> đây là this is the comparison between Rust and uh, other modern language, language. Đây là so sánh giữa cái kiểu xử trí lỗi của Rust và một cái vài ngôn ngữ hiện đại khác, chẳng hạn như Go. This is a code in Go, and this is code in Rust. We can see that how Rust error handling make you your code shorter a lot. Đây là đây là ví dụ giữa code bên Go và code, code bên Rust. Cả hai hai cái đoạn code này là đều phải có xử lý lỗi. Nhưng mà bên Rust thì bạn có thể làm ngắn hơn nhiều là nhờ cái tán tử chấm hỏi. À, vậy thì quay trở lại cái tựa đề của cái bài nói chuyện này là Rust có, có, có giúp mình thuận tiện hơn trong việc phát triển web như thế nào? So uh, now we go back to the title of the, this presentation. That's how Rust uh, is the web development. So that's how we explore, how we take advantage of Rust resource time to, 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 to do web development. Khi mà bạn làm một cái ứng dụng web á, trong cái quá trình mà bạn xử lý một cái request là qua nhiều bước mà mỗi bước đều có thể trả về lỗi. Uh, for example, when you apply a web application and you need to process a request, there are many possibilities that error can happen. For example, first, you need to check if user has been logged in. And when you check it, the error can happen when you read the session from Redis or from the disk. Chẳng hạn như là khi mà bạn xử lý web á, chẳng hạn như khi mà bạn kiểm tra coi cái người dùng này đã đăng nhập hay chưa thì cái lỗi có thể xảy ra trong quá trình bạn đọc cái session từ từ đĩa hay là từ cái một cái database như Redis and next when you fetch the uh, data from a database system the error can happen if the schema do not match the application code Chẳng hạn như trong web khi mà bạn muốn uh, đọc thông tin user từ database lên chẳng hạn như bạn muốn lấy tên, email, uh, ngày sinh nhật của user chẳng hạn thì lỗi có thể phát sinh là cái 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 cấu trúc của database bên dưới nó không có khớp với cái ứng dụng của bạn. Chẳng hạn như bạn mong đợi là cái người dùng này là sẽ có thông tin trường thông tin là năm sinh nhưng mà thực ra bạn không có lưu cái cái khi mà bạn thiết kế coi sở dữ liệu bên dưới đó, nó không có cái field đó thì đó cũng là một trường hợp xảy ra lỗi khi bạn làm web and uh, when you uh, another step is when you process the request is uh, you process and compute the data before returning to user then the error can happen if the data is not in expected format or some computation fail. Chẳng hạn như chẳng hạn như khi mà bạn đọc ngày sinh của user từ database lên đó, thì bạn mong đợi nó là sẽ là một cái chuỗi ngày, tháng, năm. Nhưng mà cái dữ liệu mà lưu trong database nó lại là một cái chuỗi vô nghĩa nào đó chứ không phải ngày tháng năm. Thì lúc đấy là một trường hợp mà lỗi có thể xảy ra. Ồ oh when render the web response to user then the error can happen when you use some template engine to render the html chẳng hạn như khi mà bạn trả bạn làm web bạn trả cái dữ liệu đấy về một cái trang web cho user nhìn thấy á có thể là bạn sẽ mong muốn là chỗ dòng chữ này là tôi tô màu đỏ chỗ dòng chữ này tôi tô đậm nhưng mà cái cốt trong cái template của bạn đó, do bạn biết ở viện bạn viết sai cú pháp á, nó không hiểu cái template engine đấy nó không hiểu trong rồi nó sẽ bắn ra lỗi. Đó, đấy là những cái trường hợp mà khi mà bạn làm web là bạn sẽ thấy những cái lỗi sẽ xảy ra như vậy. Thì thì Rose sẽ 
uh, giúp bạn như thế nào trong trường hợp này Thông thường nếu như những người nào mà làm web mà hơi ẩu một xíu á, Họ sẽ không bắt những cái lỗi đấy Thì sẽ dẫn đến tình trạng là ví dụ như Cái uh, trang web nó trắng trơn Nó không thể hiện nội dung gì cả Hoặc là nếu tệ hơn là nó sẽ làm sập server Nhưng mà trong những trường hợp đấy Thì cái cách làm đúng là sẽ hiện ra một cái thông báo Cho user biết là có chuyện gì đang xảy ra rồi nó sẽ ghi vào log để cho những lập trình viên biết là ngày đó giờ đó nó xảy ra lỗi với bối cảnh như thế này để cho lập trình viên biết để sửa lại So how we uh, apply Rust in that case We take advantage of the result type and the result time can represent the true state of the Uh, of some function like uh, if the function is okay we return the normal response and if the function return error we return the error response like 400 or 500 mình uh, mình ứng dụng uh, cái kiểu dữ liệu của Rust trong web như thế nào đó là mình sẽ dùng cái cái kiểu result đấy để sinh ra response tương ứng với cái trạng thái Chẳng hạn như mình xử lý cái request đó bằng một cái hàm Cái hàm đấy nó trả về OK Thì cái trạng thái OK đấy nó sẽ tương ứng với trả về một cái uh, response thành công Tức là cái mã là mã 200 hoặc là mã 201 Còn trường hợp uh, lỗi thì nó trả về error response thì, Tức là cái response mà có mã 400 hoặc là mã 403 Nào <cười> Và đa số các framework về web của Rust là đều uh, hỗ trợ cái kiểu uh, cái cách làm việc như thế này Tức là sẽ dùng cái kiểu dữ liệu result để trả về hai loại response khác nhau uh, Most Rust web framework uh, support uh, this usage of result that uh, return uh, successful result in case of OK And return the error response in case of error Oh, thank you Sorry, à, mình cần phải uh, nói nhanh ở đoạn này sắp hết giờ rồi à, Đây là một cái ví dụ This is one uh, example This is a function that you process a request You call uh, some function to retrieve the data from database and it can be error So in case of error You stop here and return the error response. And in in the case of success, you continue. Đây là một cái ví dụ, một cái đoạn code mà xử lý web là bạn sẽ gọi khi khi mà bạn nhận được request, bạn xử lý request đó, bạn gọi một cái hàm để lấy dữ liệu bên dưới thì nó có thể xảy ra lỗi. Ví dụ như trường hợp này gặp lỗi, mình đánh cái dấu chấm hỏi vào đây nó dừng lại, nó trả về error response. Tới đây gặp lỗi cái mình đánh dấu hỏi nó dừng lại nó trả về error response. Có một lưu ý khi mình làm về Rust với web. Đấy là khi mà mình dùng những cái thư viện thứ ba thường mỗi cái thư viện thứ ba đấy nó có những cái kiểu dữ liệu error khác nhau. Nhưng mà bình thường là những cái kiểu dữ liệu đấy nó sẽ không trả ngay về response được. Thì lúc đấy là cái cách làm của mình là mình sẽ định nghĩa một cái kiểu trung gian Mình sẽ viết viết cái chair để chuyển đổi những cái kiểu dữ liệu từ thư viện này về cái kiểu dữ liệu trung gian của mình Rồi sau đó cái kiểu dữ liệu trung gian của mình mới implement cái chair này từ, từ, từ cái framework đó để cho nó trả về response Khi mà mình dùng cái kiểu dữ liệu này á, thì mình cũng có uh, dùng cái kiểu dữ liệu trung gian của mình
So hello everyone, we need to start now. So welcome Ms. Hum. Okay, thanks for coming today. So uh, we're glad you're here and stay is your now. Enjoy the show. Thank you. Okay, uh, yeah. So hello everyone, my name is Pum. Yeah, so Today I'm gonna talk about like how you can build interactive apps with Rust and WebAssembly. By interactive, I mean with visual and with image. So my name is Poom. Uh, right now I'm starting job next week as software engineer at Metabase. But so far I have been co-founder of Creators Garden. So we are like a group in Thailand who do interactive things. So like for me myself, I have two interests. First interest is my life is about low-level computing. I'm interested in hardware, in reverse engineering, and building operating system but my other interest is art and culture so let me show you some of my past project so I have worked in an embedded system in space before so this is called the MESE the molecular encoded storage for space exploration is a DNA storage that can store data in DNA and we write a hardware to record the experiment in space. Another project I did is with MIT and with a Thai choreographer called Cyber Subin. So you might have seen that a little bit earlier. So in this project, it's an interactive project where it's an AI, where human can dance with AI. So like you might see that a little bit earlier, uh, the audience have the microphone and they can say to the AI, for example, they want to change their energy or they want to change the rotation and the AI would respond to that dance. So we showed this off in Taipei a little bit earlier. Yeah, so I'm from this group called Creators Garden. So we do a lot of like communities and projects in Thailand. So we talk about biology, we talk about maths in Thailand. Yeah, so the last project we did is actually two days ago. So this is called uh, uh, the Algorave, a bit of Thai tunes. So we have 12 artists in Thailand, six of them who create visual, like this you see on the screen, like the visual projected on the building. And six of them, they do sound, so they create music with code. So everyone used like slightly different tech stack. So some of them, they use pure data, they connect, uh, they connect data together to make music, like operators. And some of them, they write uh, JavaScript or GLSL to make image. Okay, so this is like a thought experiment I had before. What happened if we combine like the rigidity of operating systems, like the way we can express so much with so little, with the art form of uh, arts and culture. So what if we can build a tool that would allow us to use very low level components to create art essentially? So this is like, that was the source idea for my project. So this one is called Visual Assembly Canvas. So essentially it's a tool where you can create very interactive apps with essentially just writing assembly and very low level tool. So, so you can see on the left, this is assembly code. So this is a code I wrote to decode the, decode the image. So this is like completely in assembly, but then you can connect different blocks, different tools. So you can create different image. So this is like what I did at home. So I would have a MIDI keyboard and I would have a MIDI, uh, MIDI launch pad. And you can make it so that when you click this, it would make a sound. So instead of having to use a guitar or a piano, you can just write assembly. So, so you can do the reverse too. So you can like encode an animation frame. So for example, I have an animation of Bad Apple and I write assembly to decode that. So you can do that. So I think this project really encompasses two things from like the two dynamic I told you earlier. There's the computing element, but there's also the interactive, the art, the visual. So today, let's first focus on the computing. The question is, why do we need to build our own operating system, our own compiler? The reason is, do you remember what it was like, let's say, 50 years ago? 50 years ago, I, I imagine there 
like when you were getting a new computer, uh, let's say Amiga, you might get something that's very easy to work with. You you can write in a language that's very close to computer. But for today, imagine like how what you have to do just to build a web app. You have to know like JavaScript. You have to know React. You have to know Webpack. There's a lot of abstraction. So the idea is, what if you just build your own operating system? Then it's a lot easier. Then you have much more control and it's very portable. I actually got the idea from this game called Shenzhen, Shenzhen IO. I'm not sure how to pronounce this, but essentially it's a game where you work in as a member in a Chinese factory and you have to build your own circuit. So you have to connect them together and you have to write assembly to, uh, like to connect it. So at the start of the game, you have to print out a back up paper that would be like the instruction. So you would have to know, okay, there's an ad, there's a sub instruction, right? And then you would write that together and connect it together. Like this is a, this is just a game, but people have gone really crazy about it. Like some people, they try to make like a, like a little display. Some people, they try to write Mandelbrot in pure assembly, or some people, they write a maze game. So it's very amazing like what people can do with just assembly. <clears throat> so that's an inspiration for me. Like, So what if you can do that, but like not as a game, but something you would use in real life? What if you can build an OS and an instruction set from scratch? I got an inspiration from this person at the 100 Rapid Labs. So he built a project called the UXN project. His, uh, so he said he likes to go on a boat, he likes to go sailing, but on a boat, the, the internet's very bad, right? You don't have internet. So the programs he used to have were very big and bulky, like Photoshop and Ableton. So he wanted to build his own operating system that would allow him to have very like very specific, very small stack. So the, so the UXN is actually a uh, runtime, so it's like ARM or uh, it's basically like, yeah, x86 assembly or ARM, and Favara is his operating system, and Tall is his language. So basically, by just one or two person, they build their own OS, they build their own image. So this is the entirety of that, of like the system. So imagine how much instruction ARM or even x86 has. There is so much stuff. But in here, you can build the whole, whole system with just 100 lines of code. Yeah, this is literally all you need. And he also have made a little signs. So this is a comic book where you can read from front to back, and you would know how to program in assembly for the system. So it's very cute. I would recommend checking it out. And the thing is, like starting with that assembly, you can build anything, like even with GUI. So their team, they have built a solitaire game. They have built calculators and clocks and complete GUI. But starting with building the instruction set, so you can see this is their own language. And they even build like a music tool where you can control your music instruments. And they can even run it on all hardware because like if you want to run your web app, imagine like how much computing power that has. You can't just run it on like all machine, right? But if you write your own OS, you can run it wherever you want. You can run it on a toaster. You can run it on an old Game Boy. So that was my goal. I want to build my own OS just for fun and my own language from scratch. And I want it to be able to run on WebAssembly so that Everyone can use it. Yeah, so that actually took me about 320 hours just to like completely build this. And it took me around 850 commits. So that took me like about, I think, for uh, three months. Yeah. So uh, just a bit of a content warning. So the content here is going to get very nerdy. So if you don't understand, don't worry. Just talk to me later. So let's start with very simple question. What is the easiest computation or easiest calculation you can do? Yeah, one plus one, right? Super easy, every kid can do it. So in order to build a computer, you have to start with that. You have to start with one, so you have one, you have one and you do one plus one, right? So of course, in my program, you can do that very easily. You can just uh, do a push. So, so this is a stack machine. So it's, you have number 10, you have number 25. 25 times 10 is uh, 
230, which is 00FA in hex. Okay, but how the heck do you build this? I think like uh, there's a model of computation called Turing machine, right? Uh, the actual Turing machine isn't a machine like this. It's actually a math equation. So the question is what do you see here? I see tape, right? There's like a very long tape. So that tape represents what we call memory. So in order to build a proper computer, I think Alan Turing or even other computation model tell us that we need four things. We need memory, we need register, we need instruction, and we need a way to run that together. Don't worry, I'll go about this one by one. So first you need memory, right? You need a place to store your data. So how do you make memory? Oh, of course, in Rust, it's very easy. So you just allocate like a, a big vector. But to make this realistic, if you look at this, you only have limited memory, right? You don't have infinite memory. So I give myself, uh, sorry. So I give myself about six, uh, yeah. So this number of memory size is about 60,000, yeah. And then you have a chunk of memory. But the problem it was, what do you do with that? The question is you have to divide the memory into memory space, right? So the first chunk of memory, I might say, okay, I want this to be our instruction, like push or pop or add, and I want this to be the data. I want this to be something else, and I want this to be our stack. So you have to divide up the memory. So in Rust, it's very easy. You can use a constant. Okay, but if you have a big memory, you can't really do anything. So you need a data structure for computation. In this case, I choose a stack. So in computer science, there's pretty much stack machine and register machine. But personally, I like stack machine because it's really easy to implement. So for to operate on a stack, you need access to the register because you need a stack pointer. Don't worry, I'll explain what that is. And you need a stack, which is like the stack of data. So what do you need for a stack machine? First, you just need push. You need to put item on top of the stack. Second, you need pop. You need to pop that out. And you need peek to know what is on the top. Push, pop, peek, and you're, and you're done. And next, you would need something that's called register. So what the heck is a register? If you have uh, never done like computer science before, here's a quick explainer. So register is basically at your CPU, you need to have a data source to store like the very basic things. So for me, I have first I need a program counter, which just counts what line I am. So right now, I'm basically at line three. But if you count the instruct if you count the memory, it's like one, two, three, four, five. So you can see the program counter is now at five. So as you move on, like in assembly, this will count downwards. And then you have the stack pointer, which just keep tracks of like, where are you at the stack? Like, are you here? Are you here? Or are you here? So we know like what's the current size of the stack. So if you write that in Rust, again, very easy. You just, it's basically just a uh, number storage, right? Then you need instructions. So what the heck's an instruction? If you, if you have ever decompiled your program, your computer uses a lot of instruction. So ARM is like, I think quite a lot, but I think x86 is like way more. So you would have instruction like this, like for example, move the memory. So in stack machine, good news is you only need a very few. So maybe you just need push, add the data, pop, uh, get the data out, and you would need instruction to do math, right? To add, to multiply, to divide, and you might need instruction to operate on the stack. Yeah, I'm not going to go all over this, but basically this is all I have implemented and it's enough for literally everything. So in Rust, you can use something called call like an enum with value. So I would have like an enum for uh, enum value for push, for pop, for load, for store. So you can add any instruction here. Finally, you would need something that's called a fetch, decode, and execute. So to put this simply, before computer were even a thing, before this in Cold War, in, in wartime, there used to be a room called computing division. So there used to be a room where everyone is not using like mechanical computer, but they have pen and paper. Or like a little bit later, they have like more machines, but then people would literally just write on their paper to compute. So similarly in computer, we must have something that's called a fetch, 
decode and execute. So fetch means to get the instruction we want to push. Decode uh, means what that instruction is. We don't know what it means. And execute means to run it. So in this example, our machine is going to have two things, right? We have the memory space and we have the register of the CPU. So it's kind of like uh, I recommend this video from Tom Scott if you have never heard of this before. So yeah, you have the CPU and you have the RAM. And every time it's like you take like fetch, decode, and execute. And every time it goes and read the instruction and it runs that instruction. So to implement that in Rust, again, pretty easy. So you would write, so you need a fetch first. So fetch is you look into the memory, like what that instruction is. Right now I know, okay, it's a push. I want to do a push. Then I decode that instruction to know like, what do I have to do? Like, what is that in terms of memory? Like, what is that instruction? And then I have execute, which is basically run that instruction. So here's an example of instruction. So for example, what do you do with add? You have two numbers, A and B, and you add them together. Or what do you have to do with increment? You just get the number and you increment them. So almost every instruction, you can write it as something like this. OK. And finally, you have the tick. So every time the machine process is going to fetch, decode, and execute the operation. So, so this is all you really need to make a fully functional like stack machine. You need memory, register, instruction, and a cycle. But OK, what next? So if you have a computer, but you can't do anything, it's like too boring, right? You can't really do much. So I took the time to kind of imagine what do I want to do with my computer. So I, I go to the drawing board a bit and I draw, okay, I want to visualize the memory. I want it, I want to see what the memory looks like. I want to make it beautiful so it's easier to look at. And I want the machine to be able to wire to other hardware like MIDI keyboard or make music. So we just daydream a bit. But back to reality. Right now, like what we have built is essentially just a test case. It's like very simple. You have the instruction and you can run it, but you can't really type it. You need to hard code it. So that's why the next step is you need what's called an assembler. So assembler is for, if you don't know, assembler is essentially, if you write assembly like in the text format, you need to convert that into the bytecode that the machine understands. So there's a very good book I wrote called Crafting Interpreters. So this is like a very good book. They taught you how to build compilers and interpreters. Essentially, if you want to build an assembler, there's three steps. First, build a scanner. So a scanner is essentially reading your text file and trying to understand what kind of token it is. For example, in assembler, you might have a label definition. You may have, oh, this is a string definition. So you have to understand like what kind of token it is. Is it a string? Is it a number? What kind of token? And then the scanner would go over each token and try, yeah, and try to produce it. So then we have the parser. Oh yeah, sorry, it goes over each character and try to build a token. So the next step is to build a parser. So the parser, what does it do? Very simply, it goes over each token, right? And then it understands what to do with them. In this case, I want to read each token and I want to actually build a set of instruction that my machine can understand. And then finally, we have assembler. So assembler is you already have a sequence of bytecode, but you want to compile it to binary. So in this case, it's very simple. You just read that, you just read that bytecode and you try to like save it into like a binary format. So you might add a little bit of header and you might segment it a little bit. Yeah, but this is really all you need to make a fully functional assembler. You need to read the text, essentially. You need to understand the format, and you need to turn that text into well, opcodes. So this is like what the end result looks like. So yeah, so in here I have like a program. So this is a loop in assembly. So I declare like a label here called loop, and then I basically like write some assembly. 
Yeah, so if you have never done this before, don't worry. It's essentially like if you write a for loop in C, but you can see here at the end result, it's producing hex 64, which is 100. So now we basically build a fully functional like assembler that can understand this text and run it. Okay, so here's where I want to stop for a bit. And like, let me tell you where this project took a big turn. So I went to a music festival in Thailand called The Ash. So The Ash is an EDM festival where people do electronic music, right? But I think in the electronic music, a lot of people, they actually write code. So they don't use guitar, they don't use drums, but they actually write code. Uh, and it actually makes graphic like this. And it's like very cool. So that's like another inspiration from me. I want to actually build a tool that can make music with code. Okay, here's another inspiration I get. So when I was working on the AI dance project, so this is called Cyber Subin for those of you who come a bit later. So Cyber Subin is a project where we make an AI dance. So we use, so we, we basically get the data from Thai human dancer in Thailand It's called the Korn dance. And we use the data from the Korn dance to try to understand how to change the dance data. The interesting thing is that when we were building this project, my team member, he used a tool called Max MSP. So it's a tool that looks like this. So you can write like programs and you can connect them together. Or when we were at the Ash, the artists were using a program called Pure Data that can create music. So do you see the difference and similarities? Like both of these, they are very similar. They have nodes and they're wired up together to make programs. So I think this is like very good when you want to do visual computing because you see the result, like this is 3D and you can use it a lot of ways from doing music festival to doing like AI dance project. Yeah, by the way, this was written in 3JS and TypeScript. Yeah, so if, you were, if you're interested in AI dance, you can come talk with me. Okay. Another inspiration I have is a game. Does anyone know Minecraft? Okay, I think so, I think some of you know. Some of you may be too, too young or too old. So Minecraft is a game where you can place blocks, but Minecraft has a lot of mods. It's game modifications. And there's a mod called TIS3D. So in this mod, you can write assembly, but in Minecraft, it's very weird. So they would have a spec sheet like this piece of paper and you can read to understand how to write assembly. And you can write the assembly like move, loop, sub, and jump. And the program would run in Minecraft. So you can use this in Minecraft to build a factory, to automate a lot of things, but just with writing assembly and you can see the the instruction. So that really inspired me to kind of push this project to the next level. So it's not just an assembly or an OS runtime anymore, but I want to make it interactive and I want to make it visual. So how do you do that? Uh, first things first, you need a UI, right? You can't really do visual, you can't do 3D, you can't do music with just command line. So first I use uh, React Flow, which is a library in, uh, in the JavaScript world. So React Flow allows you to make flowcharts, you can connect things together. And then I write some components in React, such as this visualization. So in here, it kind of draws like each row, right? So one is the color red. Uh, seven is the color white. And then now, just with this very simple assembly, you can draw any image. So it's like very interesting. Or if you can connect it together, you can create a construct which can send the data together. Like the send, in send instruction would send data from here to here and here to here. So now you can wire up different machines and they can calculate complex things. So in computer science, there's a concept called message passing and actor model. So what is message passing? So look, look at a program like this or this. So in order to create this very complex, you basically send a message from one, one instruction to another. For example, first instruction, you might want to say, draw a circle. And then you might want to send a message there that, okay, please add more circle. And then if you add more message, then it's gonna form like a very good program, same here.
So the concept of message passing is that different programs can send message to each other and change the behavior. So the very easy way to program that is what's called actor model. So in actor model, every, every single program is an actor. So you are an actor, I am an actor, and we can send message to each other. So for example, I may send a message to you, like, please stand up, please sit down. Or you can send a message to me, please shut up, it's already over time, something like that. So everyone can have their own message and pass it so that we can control the behavior of other systems. So in Rust, you can use this very easy. You just use a vector like and store data, store message. Like I have inbox, which is the message from you to me, and an outbox, which is a message from me to you. And then we write a program that basically tries to route the message. <clears throat> yeah. So like, look at this. So I have this program, which is an assembly program. And then when I want to send the data from here to here, it basically sends a message from here to here and from here to here. So by sending message, you can chain together like very complex programs. Okay, so I think we, I'm not sure if we still have time, but we can do a bit of demo. Uh, sorry, do you know how many time left? Okay, 10 minutes, perfect. Uh, that's actually more than I thought. Yeah, so, okay. So let's like do a bit of a demo and try to understand like how the heck this even works. Okay, so let me open my notes. Okay, okay, first thing, let's talk about like the actor model. Let's try to understand like what this thing is. So first thing you have to know about actor is first it's all about message. So it's all about like what message do we want to send to other people. So let me open a uh, Rust Rover here. Boop. Okay, so as you can see, this is like my Rust code base. And uh, let's open the uh, code call message. Okay. Sorry, one moment. Uh, message. Okay, never mind, it's here. So you can see like each message is a structure. And each structure here, it has an action, which is like, what do you want to do? And the sender, which is like, where should we send this message to? So if you look at the action here, my program has just like a few action. Like each machine, they can send the data from me to you, we can read the data or we can tell them to reset. So let me actually show you like how that look like in practice. So here, uh, actually let me just clear everything. And let me start with a very simple program. So I'm gonna create a new machine, right? So here just to run it to see if it works. And then I'm gonna send a message from this to the other, other system. So I'm gonna say uh, send zero, one. So this is like sending the data, sending the message. And then I'm gonna add a pixel block. So this is where you can draw stuff. And I'm gonna send this. Uh, okay, maybe I need to send two. Uh, okay, not sure if uh, this is working correctly. Let me let me do this. Boop. Okay, so here you can see I have 128 and I send it. So there's like two data here. So we can actually inspect this to see like how the data is being sent. Yeah, actually I might show you that a, a little bit later, but let me just show you like how, how this works. So first we have to understand like what are the blocks? Okay, yeah, I think this is pretty a good start when to understand this. So you can see like this is a enum called a block data. So every block in the system has its own enum. For example, the machine block is where you can write code. The pixel block is where you can generate pixel art, like the tie flag you see earlier. And the plot block is where you can plot data. Yeah, so maybe like, so maybe let's look at the plot block. I think that one should work. So first we have the clock block, which generates like a clock signal and a plot block. So if I write this, then look at what happens. So it's gonna send a rising clock signal and then, yeah, and then it dropped a bit. 
So at every frame, there's a, there's a data that's being sent. So maybe if we stop for a bit and we try to get like the block state like this, so you can see like this is the internal JSON of the system. Then you can see every block has a structure. So maybe like the clock one is block three and that one is block four. Yeah. Okay, never mind. So because it's being sent very fast, right now like you can see the inbox and the outbox is empty. But if I put it into like a mailbox that is already overflowing, you might get to see it. Okay, so here's how the ticking works. So if you go to like the definition of each block, like I might go to, let's say a pixel block, you can see this is like what happens at every tick. So at every tick, the blocks try to process the data. For example, I have the pixel block here. Then the pixel block, when it gets a new data, we do a match and it maybe might push a new data. So it might display some message or it might read a message. So this is like basically the core loop that makes it work. And another important part is the canvas data. So in canvas here, it kind of stores the whole structure of the, of the canvas. So that means like what kind of blocks there are, how is it connected to each order? And then just with that connection, we can write a program that would handle the routing. For example, in this here, we have a function called root messages. So it would try to understand, like, it would try the new message that are generated to send that to the correct recipient. Yeah. Okay. I think another part I want to touch on is the WebAssembly part. So let's go to the WebAssembly code base. So in WebAssembly, you can basically, like, generate or expose a bit of controllers or you can expose some functions or some methods. So for example, in this case, I have a, a bunch of methods that I want to expose. So for example, from the JavaScript side, I want to get some method that would allow me to get the canvas state, or I would want some method that would allow me to add a new block. And then from the JavaScript side, I can call that method. Yeah, so that's like a quick rundown of how that works. Okay, so since we don't, we don't have any more time, so my last message is when you're building a side project, it's very recommended to learn in public. That means just write a blog, give a talk, or share it a little bit so that other people can kind of learn from it and give you feedback. So I have been writing a blog like every day that I do this project. So right now it's about 30 blogs. Yeah, so that would very that is very helpful. So I think that is it for my talk. Thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye. OK, I think maybe time for one question. OK, so yeah, any question? Yeah, if no question, feel free to just ask me later. OK, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yeah, we have a tea and coffee break till four and we'll continue after that thank you very much all of you thank you very much to you also yes thank you Welcome back. So now we are going to have a talk on decoding the black box, understanding the Go compiler from Jyotsna Gupta. She's an ex senior software engineer, Gojek. I hope it's the right pronunciation. And Jyotsna Gupta is an open source enthusiastic who previously worked as senior software engineer at Gojek, Bangalore. She has been involved with the Mozilla community since 2015 contributing in her free time as an on content reviewer, Mozilla tech speaker and Mozilla representative too. Her notable roles include serving as a two-time add-ons 
featured advisory board member and a judge in the Firefox Quantum Extension Challenge. Jyotsna is a coder by profession and a passionate settler. Shetler. She is also Firefox add-ons mentor and the creator of the privacy-themed add-on PrivateX. In recognition to her contributions to Mozilla, her name is listed in about credits of every Mozilla browser. Apart from professional experience and volunteering, Jyotsna recharges by playing badminton, table tennis, carom, chess, and basketball. She enjoys eating fruits in an exto filet and minion manic and shoeaholic and a neat freck. As a Scorpio, she loves spending time in her room or exploring the world. If not found engaging in her hobbies, she is likely dreaming for hours, maybe days. I welcome you, Josna Gupta, for this presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'll be talking about decoding the black box, understanding the Go compiler. So I just firstly un want to understand how many of you are familiar with Golang or have worked on Golang. Oh, cool. Only one person, two or two person, three person. Cool. So I'll start with the basics of a compiler, irrespective of Go compiler, or if it's a Java compiler or C++ compiler. But before proceeding with that, I'll just talk about me. Uh, uh, this sums up pretty much my professional life. Uh, right hand side is the ex previous works, which I have done involvement with the communities or I have worked with the Gojek. Uh, I've been a part of Mozilla community for since uh, for a long period of time, since eight years almost. And currently, I work at, as uh, as a senior software engineer at uh, Fold, and which is a fintech startup. And apart from that, I'm a Docker captain, and I also run Women Who Go Bangalore chapter. Uh, now let's proceed with the actual topic: decoding the black box. Uh, so what happens when you write a code and you run go build right in go you use go build to run to compile your code so i'll just focus on that part so if the source code is uh, your input right so in that part once it the source code is being passed to the lexer or basically sc scanner so this is the third part uh, so lexer actually reads the source code file and finally it it converts it into the tokens. So if you see, tokens are the very small, uh, you can the smallest unit of meaning, and it is also known as scanner, and uh, everything, everything in a code gets scanned by Lexer, and then they it, it get converted into the tokens. And that tokens could be something like keywords, like if, else, or inbuilt statements, right? Uh, so those are the identifiers, literals, or operators. And at this stage, at Lexer stage, this it also discards the white spaces and the comments. So whatever the comments you provide right in, in your source code file, those are also discarded during this stage. This is one of the first stage which happens during your compilation. Next stage happens when Lexer, in, uh, Lexer produces the output to the parser, parser consumes, ultimately consumes the output of Lexer and it creates those tokens into the AST. AST is basically a syntax tree, so abstract syntax tree. So at this level, your uh, syntax tree gets created or constructed and uh, it you can say that it's a gram grammatical representation of any program. So all the tokens which were created during the Lexer phase, right? They they will be compiled or assembled into the AST form at this stage. And what will Parcel will do? It will check the code base against the grammatical rule of your programming language. It could be Golang here, it could be Java, it could be C as well. So so that it just ensures that your program has been structured structured correctly. For example, if you if you haven't used semicolon in java right it will be thrown at this level so in go it doesn't matter right now it's optional but it uh, by default it added the semicolon so in java it will be uh, added at this level and after this uh, parser will produce the ast abstract syntax tree which will be used in semantic analysis and time checking phase 
so in this process what happens uh, ast uh, is like being chaired you can think of it as a way like a building inspector is there and it is it has come that like person has come just to see how your building looks like as compared to the blueprint blueprint you can say ast is one of the blueprint and also based on the regulations regulation as in re uh, rules and regulations of your programming language so uh, this phase ultimately involves checking the ast uh, programming uh, grammatical rules and also how how you are adhering to the grammatical uh, rules of any language in this context i'm talking about go and uh, it also ensures that operations are performed on the compatible like types for example if you are using integer or instead of a function it will throw error at this level so in this stage this those, those kind of errors would be uh, being detected and it uh, compiler will halt the compilation process immediately at this stage so next one is uh, after the type checking and semantic analysis what happens is the code uh, intermediate uh, code generation happens what happens is uh, intermediate code generation you can say is say it is as intermediate representation which is actually a lower level representation of your program the program which you wrote the source code it's actually convert gets converted into the intermediate representation and uh, through the translation of ast into the sequence of instructions and uh, it is independent of the target machine's architecture so any code the source code is getting translated the translated from tokens to uh, ast tree and then finally back to the uh, uh, like intermediate representation these are all part of the uh, these are all are platform agnostic so it doesn't matter on which target machines your architecture would be it will just perform the operations automatically and it serves as a middle ground between uh, between the optim uh, lexic lexer and the optimization of the final output so as to make the optimizations more better at this step after the ir intermediate representation has been generated now next step is optimization of that ir so at optimization level what happens why, why we do it is because of you we want to make the compilation more effortless efficient and faster so at this step uh, this step is quite important because there are two types there are two ways to do that one of the methods is ssa which is basically st static single assignment and this one variable each variable is uniquely assigned so go compiler maintains that and through this data dependency is also excluded so in turn what happens is the compilation becomes more smoother faster and efficient and uh, for example like there are different techniques to do the optimization one of them is like eliminating unnecessary calculations or reducing the number of instructions so or reducing the memory uses so those kind of uh, optimizations compiler will do at this stage um and ssa is very important in this context and after the optimization the optimized ir is converted in, converted into the machine code which is actually your binary uh, statements or instructions which are ultimately be understandable by your processor so at this stage as i mentioned this phase converts the optimized ir into the machine code and the binary instructions that your processor understands ultimately right and uh, th so all the all the instructions which were written in the ir are mapped directly to the binary instructions in this phase and uh, it if you remember i previously mentioned the all the previous stages they were platform agnostic but this stage is not pl platform agnostic in this stage the during the translation itself the specifics of the target machines are considered as for example number of number and types of the register so those are being considered while doing the compilation so this happens at this stage previous in previous stages uh, the target uh, architecture target machines architecture was not considered at all so this one is the last stage i would say where li we link all the code with your binaries so it is a final step and different pieces of your generated the uh, generated uh, machine code are being clubbed into single executable file which also includes your binary 
so in go what happens is it uh, there is a static linking happening uh, what does it mean mean basically in java static it's a dynamic dynamic linking uh, you can think of it a way uh, so your application will have some dependency libraries right so if you compile all of them into one binary that happens in go which is called as static linking but if uh, in the external libraries are being compiled they are not in included in the single like binary those are those are those are called as dynamic linking so linking has to resolve through the undefined symbols and all so you your program will ultimately be structured in a way the, uh, that this function is linked at this so and so place and hence it will be faster ultimately so it happens at the compiler phase itself and every dependency in go is included in the binary which ultimately makes the go compilation process faster as compared to java or c++ and once the linking is completed you get an executable file that that is getting operated on the that is getting operated into the memory and cpu can execute it uh, yeah this is the last step so i've mentioned in this way and uh, if you uh want to get started or if you haven't worked with it just add a log statement or add a panic statement uh just to understand the insights and compiler also provide some logging and debugging visualization capabilities this is how in go you can have logs you can see how, uh, you can see the flags you can generate uh, the print the assembly you can also do the internal parse tree you can create actually internal parse tree to such com commands and these these are inbuilt things in go and these are the additional tools which will help you while coding in go i'll not take a uh, time on this part because if you are familiar you can take a look at my slides later but compile bench is one of the main component a uh, main tool you can say uh, and uh, cmd compile contains the main packages related to the go compiler and i've mentioned everything i'll not get into it detail because it's just 15 minutes of time we have and all the resou resources i've mentioned here Uh, related to the compile bench perf all the additional tools which i have mentioned and also the first line first resource is related to a go compiler introduction it has every single thing and i have taken my like created my slide through that and thanks a lot for coming and attending my slides talk uh if you are interested in viewing my slides at this moment you can just go to slides.com zenal for asia Uh, hyphen and no hanoi uh, you will get the whole slides resources everything at a single place at there right now at this moment uh, and thank you so much if you have any questions to let me know uh, that's all for my end right now yeah thank you very much josna and uh, the hall is open for the queries to it yes. thank you for the uh, presentations uh, first of all i'm just a uh, um, uh, uh, beginner of go so sorry really, really sorry for the beginner questions so i want to ask that if uh, go compiler also have like uh, just in time compiler like we have in java so uh, down uh, so does go also have that just in time compiler uh so just in time compiler so that goes uh, go compiler also have that in the compiler or not Uh, yeah <laughs> i think it, it is answer so i think okay and it has been designed in such a way that it is that it is fast and efficient and also go language is also designed in such a way that it's very simple and compilation happens so fast that is why if you see if the java code is there similar on lines of go is there java code will take a lot of time and go go will not go compiler will not take a lot of time as compared with the two works for java mm. so and especially like if in c if you take example uh, they have uh, they don't have a garbage collection collection right gc and but go has so the, all these things are being taken care in go itself while it was being designed 
and it was designed in such a way that, for example, if I am also running the same code twice, you can print something and change it and running it and uh, making the build and compiling it and after that I make a change. So in both implementation, incremental compilation happens. So what happens only the changes which you have done in certain files that will compile compile again. Rest of the code which was pre-written it will not compile, it will not take a lot of time. Then. Ah, okay. So it's ultimately being faster and, uh, because of many several uh, thirds which which was the way both the and how the whole has also been designed. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yes, um, also, uh, would you agree that, that the uh, uh, like compile go is um, probably only um, within like, um, uh, like uh, one or two percent? Um, would you agree that uh, compiled go is are within um, are like one or two percent of like um, a C speed. Uh, uh, do you agree that that compiled Go is within um, uh, one or two percent uh, are like speed of native C? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Any more queries? Yeah. Thank you, Jyotsna. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. So we have a next presenter on the topic Golang Korea strategy to tap more gophers. And the speaker is Galin, who is called as Olivia. She's a Dev Relation Manager of Golang Korea. Olivia Choi serves as a Dev Relation Manager at AI in Education Company in South Korea and previously held in the position of Software Education Planner at 42 Seoul Campus, an institution of higher education in computer science through peer-to-peer -peer pedagogy and product-based learning. Olivia is building and leading a developer relation function at the dynamic startup or a FOSS community such as Golang Korea to identify and siege opportunities for enhancing the developer experience. She deeply enjoys leading and navigating initiatives that contribute to the growth and success of the project she is involved in. So I invite Olivia to continue with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, looks like a big crowd than I expected, so I have a butterflies in my stomach. Uh, okay. Hello, Vietnamese gophers, Korean gophers, and gophers uh, everywhere. Uh, I'm a pleasure to have you here today. I am Olivia Choi from Golang, Korea. Uh, in the next few minutes, I'm going to share with you some strategies we use uh, to reach out and more tap uh, to our fellow gophers. My talk will follow this order, but due to the short talk time, so please hold your questions until the end. First, this is my bio. You can access my LinkedIn profile via this QR code. Please scan here. Um, can I ask you some questions before I speak? Uh, who here is using or interested in Golang? Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, anyone here running or participating in a false community? Oh, uh, three, uh, three of us. Yeah, thank you. It's a fantastic see, see you guys and welcome. Um, due to the time constraints, I'll skip the detailed instruction about us. Uh, I'll pass this one and pass this one and this one too. 
And when you are running a developer community, you encounter a variety of issues reflecting both the organization itself and the voices of its users. Therefore, I'll give you a brief overview of how we use and how we address the key concerns of copers in Korea. Let's dive in. As you guys know, Go is rapidly gaining per, uh, popularity both internationally and domestically. Thank you is uh, simplicity and uh, powerful performance. Even without aggressive other advertising, Go is being well utilized by individuals and companies who recognize its true value. In Korea, also many companies, including Hyundai, uh, have adopted Go, leading to a growing demand for skilled and senior de uh, Go, de Go developers. But while, the, while there are so many, many people looking to expand their skills with Go, there are very, very few opportunities for them to grow and learn. So we've taken the initiative to provide numerous opportunities for, for learning and growth, focusing on the following three core values. The first value is connection. We had in-person events like uh, about once a month, like hackathons, seminars, meetups, and networking events uh, where Korean gopers gathered together. As a result, the impact has been widespread. Especially last year, over 10 gopers collaborated to translate and publish this book under our group name not a single individual or a small group of experts. Next up is conference for a connection. If you are a Gopher, you are likely familiar with GoperCon, right? Uh, an annual conference held in uh, various countries. Uh, so we held, we held also GoperCon Korea for the first time uh, on a large scale in a platform for sharing knowledge and fostering mutual growth. And hosting it for the first time was a significant achievement for us. At this conference, we invited uh, speakers with intermediate or higher skills and experience in Korea. This approach resulted in high satisfaction among passionate goper, uh, Korean gopers. The primary impact can be summarized by these numbers. Now, let's proceed to the second value, which is diversity. We harness diversity and collaborate with other communities and experts to fostering curiosity and learning among gopers. These values are crucial in achieving our goals of learning and growth. In Korea, all tech infra and information are centralized in Seoul, you know, uh, making it challenging for gopers outside of Seoul uh, to access employment and learning opportunities easily. To address this, uh, we run a program called the Go To Everywhere, traveling to different regions to learn about the latest Go skills and trend. In fact, the feedback also has been positive. Uh, we are spreading the, the trend for all the Korean gopers, actually. And we also have a scholarship program, uh, especially for teens and children. And we are also running programs to bridge the digital gender gap. One notable example is Women Who Go. This program actually took place in Seoul at this January uh, of this year, and satisfaction was better than I expected. In fact, at every GO event, over 90% of uh, attendees were typically male gopers. 
So it was the first to have over 70% female speakers and participants gathered. The numbers looked promising, I think. Now, let's move on to the final value, its volume. In reality, due to the relatively small user base and adoption rate of Go in Korea, uh, expanding the volume globally is essential, I think. Therefore, since last year, we've been planning collaborative programs with Go experts and community groups in countries like Germany, Australia, and Japan, and more. Uh, by tapping into their global level expertise, Korean gophers can grow faster and reach, reach gre uh, greater, greater height, I think. Uh, in, a, in a nutshell, the three values I've introduced to you so far has been made pos uh, possible because they are uh, ultimately about being together with users, companies, and partners. In the end, the key to enhancing and driving growth in a GoPro community experience lies in the keyword together and relationship. Don't you think? I think relationship and the together keyword very, very important every, to every communities and organizers and its users. Actually, uh, besides these, there are so many, many, many more issues uh, related to the sustainability operation of a GoPro community. Uh, various issues such as project management for a uh, goal achievement, uh, schedule management, sponsor acquisition and management, and more. For instance, we've officially registered as a corporate entity in Korea to ensure systemic, uh, system, systematic operation and transparent accounting. It hasn't been an easy journey to us. And I'd love to share our journeys in uh, securing cooperating, corporate uh, sponsor, sponsorship. But it seems we are out of time. Uh, it's time to wrap up, I think. So if given the if given the opportunity sometime, I look forward to sharing some experience and insight with you guys through another talk. With that, I'll conclude my talk here. I hope this talk has been interesting to all of you. All of you. So I'll wrap, it, uh, I'll wrap up here. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> ah. Uh, and last, uh, if anyone here uh, resonates with the values I've shared uh, this talk and would like to share our knowledge and experience at GoPercon Korea uh, 2024 uh, this October in Korea, I encourage you to submit a pro a CFS with, uh, with me. Uh, with that, I'll conclude my talk here really, really. Thank you so much. Yeah, today we have another talk. In fact, the last talk of the day, Modern Full Stack Web Development with T3 Stack. It is from, yeah, Pratamesh, and he's an LFX mentee, Cloud Native Computing Foundation. He's, uh, he's also a full stack developer and love to build web and mobile applications with JavaScript, Net.js, Net Flutter, and MERN Tech Slack. He's also involved in blockchain and smart contract development with experience in building on several chains like Ethereum, RV, Arbitrium, Neo, Concordium, etc. He also worked in open space with organizations like CNCF through the LFX mentorship program. Uh, the, uh, the Palisados Foundation during Google Summer of Code 2003 and Neo Protocol through the MLH Fellowship. Currently part of RV India Launchpad. He is working on the project Better IDE, which aims to make it easier for the new users to work on the test 
onboard and rv and aos welcome pratamesh yes thank you for the lovely introduction so like he has already introduced me so like today i will be talking on modern uh, full stack development using the t3 stack so uh to give you an overview of the t3 stack t3 stack is a combination of six tools and technologies mainly nextjs trpc typescript prisma tailwind and an authentication provider like clerk so like even though uh, it's a combination of six technologies the main focus of my talk will be nextjs and trpc like it's it's not possible to cover all those topics in 15 minutes so i am sorry if i have to go a little bit fast so let's just start with nextjs like has anyone here worked with nextjs before okay quite a lot of people so yeah so nextjs basically a full stack react framework which combines nextjs as well as uh, nextjs and react to give a full stack solution for web apps so here here is a overview of nextjs like it provides some features like automatic uh, routing client and server side rendering uh, efficient data fetching and built in support for nextjs as well as image and font optimization so uh, i will go into details of other things like with uh, nextjs you get support for automatic routing so if uh, you have worked with react or vue you must have noticed that to set up routing you need some external libraries like react router dom or something and the configuration is a lot of overhead and like unnecessary boilerplate code which really like lengthens the development time so what nextjs does is it infers your routing and your routes based on a directory structure so uh, on the top directory this page.js will serve as a index to your site and if you create a folder name dashboard and then create a page in this then it will automatically infer the routes so you don't need to configure routes like slash dashboard will be this component slash home will be this component nextjs does this automatically for you and then another feature of nextjs is like uh, server side rendering so uh, if you uh, click on a view page source of a react app this is what you will get it's basically an empty page so what the problem with this is like your search engine cannot know what is the content of your page so let's say you have a e-commerce platform or you have a blog then google or any other search engine cannot really know the contents and thus your site becomes very poor with seo so nextjs helps it renders the site on the server and then sends the html to your client so browsers know what exactly your web page contain the meta tags and everything which really boosts the seo performance of any site with uh, you can do that with react as well but that's a lot of configuration and lot of overhead and the next feature of nextjs is it provides efficient inbuilt hooks like use swr uh, with which you can like cache data invalidate data it will refresh data for you so that makes managing data very easy and efficient so to uh, summarize i would say nextjs is basically react on steroids so like uh, if here are some full stack developer i would like to ask what is one of the most annoying things about building full stack apps anyone yeah configuration configuration okay integration okay integration with the back end so yeah i think yes you might have an amazing back end you might have an amazing front end but the api integration is always a weaker link between your project like uh, integrating api is a lot of pain so here is how like usual uh, here is how usually you build full stack apps the back end guy writes the api and then they can generate maybe postman docs then in the front end what you do is use the fetch method or exios to get data but the biggest problem with this is you don't know what data will be returned it's just an object you don't know whether it will be an array an object a nested object or anything so you just keep checking the docs you like write code you go to postman docs and and then check if it's sending products if it's sending items elements or xyz or it's just sending directly an array 
So like when you work on smaller teams in a startup, it is really a group of three to four people. They don't maintain a very robust documentation. You just check with the backend developer. So the thing is that you need to keep on checking the documentation for every API. And if you have 50 or 100 API, then it's really becomes a pain point. So, and when, when you log off on Friday and come back three days later, you forgot everything. And then you have to debug your code with hundreds of console log statement. It has always happened with me. So here is where TRPC comes into play. TRPC basically stands for TypeScript Remote Procedure Calls. The so uh, it is actually used to completely eliminate the API layer so that the front end and the back end are fully type safe. So for context, it is so type safe that it actually provides auto completion in the front end. Your front end actually knows what data will be returned by the back end. You don't need to integrate APIs. You don't need to worry about what data will be returned. So how does it? does that. So uh, previously I told like Next.js combines the React side of the code with Node.js. So here is what the directory structure of an Next.js project look like. Uh, these are the client side pages and there's a special uh, folder named API. All the files inside this API folder will be treated as a backend code. This runs on a serverless function or a Node.js server. So in this, you have the backend and the frontend in the same code repository. So TRPC leverages the fact that you both have your frontend and backend in the same project. And then basically you can call those APIs as if they were pure JavaScript function, just like you would call a normal JavaScript function, let's say match.add, match.subtract. Uh, so effectively you have completely eliminated the API layer. I will show the demo. Uh, is this visible? So, so as you can see here, uh, for this is the backend part of the code, and this is the frontend part of the code. And here, this is where the backend is getting called. Here, I'm, I'm calling client.grid.query. This is basically here we are passing a message. And then this is the backend code. So here we are taking an input message, which is of type string. And then we are just returning hello and that input. Let's say I pass false, then it will just return hello false. And if I say I will pass world, it will return hello world. So currently it's taking the, the name of the object is message here, the name of the key. And let's say if the backend developer tomorrow decides to change the key. Here we have changed the key from message to name. So as you can see, as soon as like the backend developer changed the key from message to name, it is showing error in the front end. So the front end knows what data is actually required by the backend as well as what is returned by the backend. So it's completely type safe across front end and backend. And the thing is, it won't even let me compile the front end unless and until it is type safe with the backend. So what usually happens is sometimes backend developer, like they just change the backend sometimes, then the frontend developer forgets, or maybe there is a version mismatch between frontend backend. And then it just basically like tears down the entire frontend. There is a client side error or something and the production breaks. With this, you can move from zero to one without breaking anything in production. Because if there is a mismatch between front end or back end, uh, any one of them, then it won't even let you compile. So no more production errors due to API. As you can see, it will compile only when I fix the code in sync with the back end. So this is basically the purpose of TRPC. So yeah, this is like how you feel when your front end and back end sync integrates completely perfectly fine. So yeah, TRPC is not just about eliminating APLS. And if you have worked with React and 
then you must have noticed that you have to use like tens of use state like set is loading you need to you need to keep track of is your data loading is there error is there an array of errors and of what to show then trpc does everything for you it has automatic support for error and loading state it uh, also uh, sends the front end and back end are in sync and let's just say you update some data in the back end trpc knows which data has been updated which data has been changed or deleted so once you uh, perform and write or write operation it automatically caches uh, like it automatically invalidate the cache and loads fresh data for you you don't even need to handle the caching manually it does that automatically for you and if you need support for very complex type then it also support complex schemas using zord so you don't need to manually write schemas and sync them with your backend so yeah that was basically like nextjs and trpc on how they work like how much time do i have how much time do i have okay just give me 2 minutes so like one more uh, to take this a uh, step further you can use an orm like prisma so uh, in the previous slide we saw trpc sits between your front end and back end we can do the same thing between your back end and the database using an orm so orm is basically it's uh, lets you write database model so your database has a single code for database it doesn't matter if you are using sql you are using no sql you are using postgres mysql you can just create a single model like this and prisma will automatically transpile your database code to whatever language so just like trpc uh, prisma provides auto completion in database queries it makes the backend and the client database safe it provides a very high level easy to understand sdk and also if you are working with production it provides you database migration and on a cherry on top prisma actually gives you the studio so you can visualize your database using a gui tool you can update the data as well as like play with your data without need to manually enter all the queries on the console and the last one is authentication management it uh, i haven't added slides for it but clerk is basically a tool which with you can like plug and play authentication services to your app it just you need to enter few apis and it will take care of your authentication it provides ready to use components so that you don't have to waste time setting up authentication on your app so yeah that was it i hope this talk help you and may helps you launching your product from 0 to 1 very quickly without breaking anything in production thank you any questions from the audience do you have questions to ask yes yes hi there uh, can you uh, uh, can you actually use nextjs without node on the server can you generate static contents can you generate static uh, files or contents with nextjs Mm, yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, like, usually, it is not a scenario, but it can actually be written just from the built backend of the code. Like you can just make an empty file directory and put all your backend code inside of the API loader, so it will only serve the uh, Node.js yes, API, not the frontend. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Question, Pradeepish. Uh, are there any companies using this T3 stack for their uh, full stack development? Yes. Okay. 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 What is the other company to technology other than this T three stack? Okay. Okay. Yes, right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Any more questions to ask?
so thank you very much and and we end up this session all of you thank you very much bye bye everyone bye yes thank you <laughs>